Papa Francesco, è con grande piacere che le porgo il mio saluto e le esprimo, esprimo la grande gioia di tutti quelli che sono qui presenti per averci ricevuti e dato l'opportunità di trascorrere alcuni minuti con lei. La storia delle tre istituzioni qui rappresentate, ossia l'Università Gregoriana, l'Istituto Biblico e l'Istituto Orientale, ci ricorda che esse sono state affidate alla Compagnia di Gesù dai Suoi predecessori e noi abbiamo cercato di essere fedeli, come ne siamo stati capaci, alla missione originaria, quella cioè di servire la Chiesa. Quella cioè di servire la Chiesa.
With varying fortunes and making slower progress as time went on, the Jesuit order at last reached the pinnacle of its power and prestige in the early 18th century. It had become more influential and more wealthy than any other organization in the world. It held a position in world affairs that no oath-bound group of men has ever held before or since. The Jesuits were masters of the courts of almost all the Catholic kings and sovereigns, wrote Saint Simon in his memoirs and Father Cordara, Society of Jesus, admitted that nearly all the kings and sovereigns of Europe had only Jesuits as directors of their consciences, so that the whole of Europe appeared to be governed by Jesuits only. In the dark and middle ages, whoever dared to think independently of Catholicism was mercilessly silenced by Catholic sword and fire. Following the birth of Protestantism, the Catholic Church, in its attempt to annihilate it, plunged Europe into a sea of blood. Catholic absolutism, owing to its ability to attack any man, culture or civilization anywhere and at any time, it permitted to grow, will repeat all the horrors of the past, Catholicism and totalitarianism being indivisible. Like Siamese twins, the two cannot be separated. The sons of Loyola are today, and may we say more than ever, the leading wing of the Roman Church. As well if not better disguised than of old, they remain the most eminent ultramontanes, the discreet but efficacious agents of the Holy See throughout the world, the camouflage champions of its politics, the secret army of the papacy. There is no record in history of an association whose organization has stood for 300 years unchanged and unaltered by all the assaults of men and time, and which has exercised such an immense influence over the destinies of mankind. The Jesuit may be individually honest unless the interest of his order obliges him to be otherwise. For there are no considerations of religion, honesty or virtue which he does not feel himself bound peremptorily and at all times to sacrifice to this one supreme consideration. The end sanctifies the means, is his favorite maxim, and as his only end, as we have shown, is the order. At its bidding, the Jesuit is ready to commit any crime whatsoever. But there is a religious society, the tendency of which is highly dangerous, and which should never have been admitted into the territories of the Empire, viz. the Society of Jesus. Its doctrines are subversive of all monarchical principles. The general of the Jesuits desires to be a sovereign master, the sovereign of sovereigns. Everywhere that the Jesuits are tolerated, they strive for power at any price. Their society is by nature fond of ruling and nourishes, therefore, an irreconcilable hatred of all existing power. Any action, any crime, however atrocious it may be, is meritorious if committed for the interest of the society or by the orders of its general. Romanism is not a religion merely, but a political system. The constitution of the Church of Rome may be considered the most formidable combination that was ever formed against the authority and security of civil government, as well as against the liberty, reason and happiness of mankind. Peace and prosperity are impossible under papal and priestly rule, 
as all history attests. The papacy, says Prince Bismarck, has ever been a political power which, with the greatest audacity and with the most momentous consequences, has interfered in the affairs of this world. The history of England since the Reformation could be written as a recurrent and generally combined attack of the Roman Catholic Church and the totalitarian state. The public is practically unaware of the overwhelming responsibility carried by the Vatican and its Jesuits in the start of the two world wars, a situation which may be explained in part by the gigantic finances at the disposition of the Vatican and its Jesuits, giving them power in so many spheres, especially since the last conflict. There is abundance of incontestable proof that the forces of religion, as represented by the Catholic Church, have succeeded in dominating the political and social field, and that there exists a close bond between them and the origins, methods and objectives of the whole Nazi-Fascist movement in Europe. Furthermore, this domination has already spread to America. History proves that, in every attempt made during the past half century against the liberal progress of mankind, the Jesuit order, as a leader of Catholic action, has played a decisive role. We can go even so far as to state that Nazi fascism had its origin in the Society of Jesus, and that, like other movements in the past analogous to fascism today, it was planned to serve the traditional aims of the disciples of Ignatius Loyola. I learned much from the Order of the Jesuits, said Hitler. Until now there has never been anything more grandiose on the earth than the hierarchical organization of the Catholic Church. I transferred much of this organization into my own party. I'm going to let you in on a secret. I am founding an order. In my burgs of the order, we will raise up a youth which will make the world tremble. Hitler then stopped, saying that he couldn't say any more. The SS organization had been constituted by Himmler, according to the principles of the Jesuits order. The regulations and the spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly. The Righteous Führer SS, Himmler's title as Supreme Chief of the SS, was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits General, and the whole structure of the direction was a close imitation of the Catholic Church's hierarchical order. A medieval castle near Paderborn in Westphalia, and called Vebelsborg, was restored. It became what could be called a SS monastery. A clever masquerade has always been characteristic of the political activities of Jesuit Catholicism. Jesuitry is a word in all our dictionaries that is defined as synonymous with subtle duplicity, indirection and disingenuousness. History is witness to the undeniable fact that the Jesuit order, founded in 1540 for the express purpose of counter-reformation, has excelled in the art of Machiavellian duplicity. It is an organization founded on military lines to fight for the political restoration of the Roman papacy, and is the only order in the Catholic Church that binds its members by special oath for this purpose. The Jesuits take a solemn oath to fight a crusade for Catholic restoration, the success of which has always depended first on the complete destruction of Protestantism and its increasing liberalizing effects on political and social life for the past 400 years. For it was Protestantism that undermined the political power of the papacy in the past. It made religion a matter of individual choice. It liberated the individual from the authoritarianism of kings and popes. It freed the civil state from ecclesiastical interference. It caused non-Catholic governments to deny outright the vital claim of the Church of Rome to be, by divine right, a universal, independent entity and superior to all other forms of government. It took away from the Church of Rome direct control over all the institutions that go to make up the life of men, marriage, education, charitable, cultural and recreational activities. The SS organization had been built up by Himmler on the principles of the Order of the Jesuits. The service statutes and spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius Loyola formed a pattern which Himmler assiduously tried to copy. Absolute obedience was the supreme rule. Each and every order had to be accepted without question. The Righteous Führer SS, Himmler's title as the supreme head of the SS, was intended to be the counterpart of the Jesuits General of the Order and the whole structure of the leadership was adopted from these studies of the hierarchic order of the Catholic Church. 
The intermeddling of the society in the affairs, political, ecclesiastical and civil, of many countries is related in numerous works and repeatedly produced the suppression and expulsion of the order, though it constantly reappeared with new names. In 1716, the French army was infested with Jesuitical and anti-Jesuitical societies. The Parliament of Paris suppressed them in 1762. They were abolished by Papal Bull in 1773 at the demand of France, Spain, Portugal, Parma, Naples and Austria. They are, however, still to be found everywhere and they hold considerable property in England. A modern writer justly calls them the Black International. Historically, the Jesuits are given credit for the gunpowder plot of 1605, fomenting the Thirty Years' War, the encouragement of the aspiration of Mary Stuart, which led to her execution, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes by Louis XIV, 1685, and numerous other great events of history. Now, Rome is perfectly consistent in her demand for the control of civil government. If her teaching were true, that there is no salvation outside the church, she is bound to compel all to belong to the church, even if she has to call in the civil power to help her to enforce submission. This power she has ever invoked and utilized. It is well known that the Jesuits were expelled from every country of Europe, and even put under the ban of the Pope and dissolved by Papal Bull on account of their restless intrigues in every country, their nefarious and immoral policy, and their audacious crimes. Of course the Jesuit writers on the various papers and periodicals take every side in politics. It matters not whence the public are led, so long as they are ultimately led to the desired point. Since the great upheaving of 1789, the efforts of the Jesuits have been persistently directed to a recovery of their former ascendancy over states and rulers. Before the revolution, they insinuated themselves into courts and gained influence directly over princes and statesmen. Since 1789, power has been attached to electoral majorities, that is, the people, and to newspapers, that is, the press, and to money, that is, financial power. The whole effort of the Jesuits has therefore been directed to manipulating these three sources of influence. Are we indeed so beggared as to be dependent on the charities of the Holy Alliance and the Jesuits of Europe for funds and teachers to educate our youth in what? The principles of despotism forbid it patriotism. We cannot be too often reminded of the double character of the enemy who has gained foothold upon our shores. For although popery is a religious sect and on this ground claims toleration side by side with other religious sects, yet popery is also a political, a despotic system which we must repel as altogether incompatible with the existence of freedom. I repeat it, popery is a political, a despotic system which must be resisted by all true patriots. In what manner do the Jesuits recruit themselves? There are in Europe a great many noble but poor families who, still ignorant, blind and superstitious, keep faithfully this device, nobility, royalty, papacy. The Jesuits, who for several centuries have dreamed and secretly endeavored to get for the Pope the universal monarchy, hate kings and constitutional governments. There are families now about the country in which masonry is a forbidden topic because its introduction would revive the old quarrel and turn the peaceful tea table into a scene of hot and interminable contention. There are still old ladies, male and female, about the country who will tell you with grim gravity that if you trace up masonry through all its orders till you come to the grand tip-top head mason of the world you will discover that that dread individual and the chief of the society of Jesuits are one and the same person. At about the time Macbeth was first performed, the king, saved from death by what he regarded as a miracle, praised the wisdom of the Venetian Republic for the measures she had taken against the Jesuits. O oh, blessed and wise Republic, how well she knows the way to preserve her liberty, for the Jesuits are the worst and most seditious fellows in the world. They are slaves and spies, as you know. He then embarked on a discourse about the society. By a naval induction from all the kingdoms and provinces of the world, he demonstrated that they have always been the authors and instruments of all the great disturbances which have taken place. 
the organization of the hierarchy is a complete military despotism, of which the Pope is the ostensible head, but of which the Black Pope is the real head. The Black Pope is the head of the order of the Jesuits, and is called a general. He not only has the absolute command of his own order, but directs and controls the general policy of the Church. He is the power behind the throne, and is the real potential head of the hierarchy. The whole machine is under the strictest rules of military discipline. The whole thought and will of this machine to plan, propose and execute is found in its head. And now we come to the last desperate conspiracy to overthrow our government and make the rebellion a success by resort to the favorite policy of the Jesuits, that of assassination. Jesuits, an ecclesiastical order proverbial through the world for cunning, duplicity and total want of moral principle, an order so skilled in all the arts of deception that even in Catholic countries, in Italy itself, it became intolerable and the people required its suppression. The popular feeling in Venice, 1606, when the Jesuits were driven out from that city, expressed itself most forcibly. Great crowds had accompanied the exiles to the seashore, and the farewell cry which resounded after them over the waves was, Ande in Malora, get away and woe be to you. That cry was echoed throughout the two following centuries, says Michelet, who gives this statement in Bohemia in 1618, in India in 1623, and throughout all Christendom in 1773. The Jesuits are famous as confessors. The reason is obvious. The confessional is a window through which to explore the secrets of families and neighborhoods. I cannot better close this note than in the words of Lincoln himself. In 1864 he said, If the American people could learn what I know of the fierce hatred of the priests of Rome against our institutions, our schools, our most sacred rights, and our so dearly bought liberties, they would drive them out as traitors.